we are back. Um, portion of the meeting to order. Um, so we're going to do with public comment, we're going to have initial, well, public here in general, but we are going to have an initial public comment, uh, and then we're going to have also a period after the budget presentation uh, for public comment on the budget so people can um, give comment on what's been presented. Uh, given the number of people here, unless it grows, uh, I think we have plenty of time for that public comment at 745, um, but if the number does grow, uh, we will make sure that there's some sort of time limit. So, um, so it's orderly, and then also, I uh, just want to reiterate in order to get support to show up, um, we'll have that public comment session that the board will discuss, and we will not be taking any comments from the public during the board uh, portion of the discussion. Um, so any Initial public comments. Um, if you step up if you, you have some. Great, otherwise, uh, we go to the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve as presented. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There's, there's additional lines here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's in our oh, consent the, agenda, Jim? <laughs> Minutes of November 14th, Division Statement, Co-Curricular Contracts, Policy for Adaptation and Transportation, and Warrants. So, apparently additional warrants. That's only one. I'm looking at my name. So, she's good now. We're good. Um, I passed those on to Jim. I'm actually not able to sign those anymore. So we got them. So, so Jim's got them. Okay. So I've only signed one more. No, that's the one. That's it. It's just the one. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Good. I can hear most of it. Okay. We'll shout. Uh, so all those in favor of consent agenda? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, learning focus. Uh, the help? ladies. Hi. Uh, actually, and before you start, yeah. let me just preface, um, just to give the board the context of what I asked you to talk about today. A while ago, Jim asked um, when the students came on on the board to talk about um, how the student, the avenue students had towards addressing when they had a safety concern at school and. Um, rape culture and things of that nature. So I posed that question to the students for this time around. So I just wanted to make sure that, that yeah. was, you knew where that was coming from. So yeah, just to add a little on that, just kind of like, you know, are the students feeling that if there is an issue and they're having a problem that they, they have a safe environment where they can go and have that resolved and that's known and it's both known and people feel comfortable with what's there. So go ahead. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so uh, just following our normal format, we just have a few celebrations. Um, so to begin with, uh, the Montpelier High School Mask is having their production of Once on This Island this weekend, which they've been working on since like the beginning of the school year. So it's very exciting. Um, the Racial Justice Alliance has already started planning our um, Black History Month events just to make sure that it goes as smoothly as possible. And so we've broken up into committees to make sure that we're, I don't know, working as hard as we can and being as effective as possible. So we're already excited. Um, and as you probably all know, a uh, series rose on to the top of the Capitol building <laughs> and uh, the honor choir sang and um, some UES classes attended. So that's really cool. And the honor choir was wonderful. I like that. <laughs> I'll let them know. <laughs> um, and this weekend, MHS Wild, which is sort of our outing club and focuses on getting out and enjoying nature and what Vermont has to offer, went snowshoeing on Mount Hunger. So that... uh, and at UES, uh, a worker from <coughs> Prevent Child Abuse Vermont um, has been visiting. Um, to teach some classes about like respecting other people's spaces and their bodies, um, which is kind of 
just amazing and really cool that it's starting so early. <coughs> And MHS Earth Group has started working on some new signage in the cafeteria because um, we want to make sure that students are aware of what they can compost and trash and recycling and I'm helping make those signs so it's kind of exciting and um, to, we're also just working on our larger campaigns of um, sustainability and making sure our students are aware of how they can be more eco-friendly in their daily practices and um, food waste in the cafeteria and student activism in regards to, I don't know, helping fight climate change. So it's good. Cool. Um, I can move into student concerns and um, we wanted to highlight continued efforts to support diversity and inclusion and Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools education and specifically speak to the equity policy and um, I myself am a member of Montpelier's Racial Justice Alliance and at today's lunch meeting I asked them like hey I'm presenting tonight at the meeting and I was wondering if there's anything you wanted me to speak to and um, they had some really important points that I also agree with and they wanted to place emphasis and highlight the importance of an equity specialist in sort of just every aspect of the lives of our students throughout the district and ensuring that like from the time they're elementary school students to when they're high schoolers they don't have to face the feeling of being marginalized and it, whether it is in regards to their identities or just social dynamics in some way that they can be supported and I think that having someone hired by the district that is trained in supporting equity in education and knows the ins and outs of it um, and is able to place their just to have their job be placing focus on ensuring that all of our policies are equitable is is really fundamental to ensuring that our students receive an equitable education and they also wanted to highlight uh, the importance of the language in the equity policy and to make sure that it yes it's meant to support all of our students in the district but when we speak of equity we also speak of uplifting students who are disadvantaged whether it's socioeconomically or whether they face gender bias or racial discrimination or some form of I don't know discouraging environments that they have to handle in growing up in today's society and that so so although we want to support all students and the equity policy will do so we need to make sure that we're placing enough focus on supporting marginalized students and that the language of the policy reflects that. And we're excited to the Equity Policy Committee, which includes Emma, me, and some members of the Gender Sexuality Alliance at MHS and our Racial Justice Alliance are gonna meet with Libby um, next week and really just work on organizing our thoughts and brainstorming to see how best we can move forward to make progress. Uh, and just really quickly, um, just going off of that, uh, student needs, um, just we want to continue to um, bring this up and prioritize the achievement gap, just focus on like uh, research and increasing uh, professional development, um, just to ensure that all students are learning at the highest levels possible and that bias isn't interfering with their capability to access the wonderful education that we have here. Um, yeah, and so moving on to the question that Jim asked. Mm -hmm. And so speaking of educational resources, the, the question that was asked to us specifically was what avenues are available to students to ensure they feel safe at school? and ch ch channels of communication around issues that arise. And we think that it really speaks to how resources are made available to students in all aspects of their life um, here at, in the district. And um, 
when we speak of the achievement gap, we speak of educational resources and making sure that they're empowered as students and as learners and as global citizens and that opportunity opportunities are made oh, they're made aware of opportunities and are able to access the educational resources that are available to them and just reach their full potential as students and um, it kind of it relates to what we had previously spoken on as well in relation to the achievement gap which is um, sometimes teachers and staff have different expectations of different students because they get to they coordinate with them on a really personal level in a smaller school community and environment and oftentimes um, by cultivating I don't know close relationships with their students and the um, students in the district they will treat certain students differently and certain students will be comfortable and um, with certain teachers and a lot of times that reflects in how students navigate the resources made available to them in the district so there might be specific roles of support like social workers or guidance counselors but students might not know how to reach out to them and a lot of times when, when I, I asked my fellow peers at MHS about how they felt and who they were most comfortable reaching out to and they mentioned specific teachers that they were able to cultivate a close relationship with in their time as their students and really felt like they could trust and a lot of times that isn't necessarily um, universal with every staff member and um, yeah so resources might be available to students but they might not know about them and we need to ensure that more students are aware of support systems here um, rather than just a select few that are viewed as a, I don't know like the right fit for um, certain opportunities or might seem like they need extra support because it's often hard to communicate that yeah. um, so you mentioned rape culture mm -hmm. um, when you brought up this question um, and something that I thought a lot about was how we're not impervious to the turmoil, like social and political turmoil that might be happening in our country and world. Um, but I do think that we do a great job at um, Montpelier High School, in my experience, and hopefully in other in the lower schools, um, uh, to acknowledge and discuss those um, events. And uh, I think that does a good, that really helps kind of support students in um, like just dealing with those situations. But um, at the same time, I think that we should be assessing gender bias a little bit um, more closely, uh, mm -hmm. like gender bias in the classrooms and um, dress codes, even athletic codes. Um, yeah, I facility facilities like. Um, gender-neutral bathrooms, um, those have all been very, like, focusing on those things would be helpful in making um, young women, specifically, uh, feel safe in schools. Mm -hmm. And when we speak about sort of the fact that we aren't impervious to the greater societal climate of today's world, our goal isn't really to insulate students from the outside world when we try to change school culture, but it's to provide the infrastructure to make sure that they're able to be prepared for being socially responsible people and, and being globally minded citizens. And that includes how they navigate rape culture and whether they are perpetrators. And so we have student support groups like The Conversation, which meets um, during Solon blocks about once a month or so and that's a way for students to facilitate and partake in dialogue regarding rape culture and um, trying to change the culture on campus and I think that our student groups have been really effective in promoting I don't know a more positive culture but that there's still work to be done in that regard and that are, yeah. Also, sorry, this might be a lot to be throwing at the board, but um, also just 
like starting early, um, mm -hmm. I think something that I really appreciated seeing was uh, the uh, worker from um, ch uh, Preventing Child Abuse Vermont um, visiting the elementary school and just talking about consent and issues of, that relate to sexual harassment and violence um, and just starting those things, mm -hmm. those concepts early um, does a lot in preventing uh, really like icky environments for young women um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. yeah and also it helps promote like intellectual risk taking in like young women when they feel comfortable mm -hmm. um, in in their environment in their learning environment and that can be physically or academically etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. I have a question yeah. I have a question. Um, I assume we track reported incidents related to harassments and bullying of different kinds. Are we seeing an increase or a decrease, or is there any trends related to that? Look to my principal colleagues. Yeah. Yes. Do you all see an increase or a decrease, or staying the same with HHB investigations? Overall, I would say there's a decrease in the number of instances that get to be that confirm a policy violation. Right. There are certainly always inappropriate student behaviors that we are navigating, particularly at the middle school. There's an awful lot of learning around the social dynamics and how to be a good citizen. But in terms of violating the policy, those numbers are not going up. Okay. Similar. Um, I think the numbers are steady and may in declining, but I don't know. I, I'm always sort of suspect of you know what the real experience is for students versus what ends up reported and consequenced. Um, so I, I'd be hesitant to say that any of our numbers um, would reflect dramatic change for. I, speaking from personal experience within my family, I think for African American kids or other marginalized kids, they, they feel it, they hear it, they're impacted by it in, at the elementary and into the middle school level. At that point, they either become just numb to it or they're navigating it on themselves without involving other people. So I'm not sure, you know, I think I'm, what I'm trying to say is that they, at the different levels of where the kids are in their educational process, you'll have a different type of incident perhaps being reported. And if you're, if you're black or you're gay or marginalized in some other way, by the time you hit your sophomore year of high school, I imagine most of them are dealing with it individually, unless it's really egregious. It could very well be. Yeah. What's kind of the, the peer culture around um, incidents? I mean, if, some, if someone says something that is arguably harassment or certainly inappropriate or you know, is, is targeting someone for uh, you know, gender or sexuality or, or race, do you feel there's do people call them on that? Is, it, is there a student self-performance where it's kind of like, hey, that's, that's not cool? Or is it or what, the other way, or does a lot of that stuff happen where people aren't around? Well, we're not in every friend group or peer group <laughs> at our school, obviously. obviously. Yeah. So my answer is going to be, I think we, <laughs> my peer group, I can only speak from my experience, <laughs> which is a good experience. Um, I feel like if somebody says something, that targets somebody else's identity, we feel comfortable calling them out or going to an adult if it's egregious. Um, but then I'm also very privileged, so maybe I'm not observing everything. Yeah. I have a pointed question on, that pertains to some of these issues. I heard from a parent uh, in the past week, and she was okay with me sharing this experience, um, that, and this is a family that supports gender neutral bathrooms, um, and uh, her daughter's in the middle school, and apparently her daughter is avoiding going to some bathrooms, um, 
because there are eighth grade boys in the bathroom. Do we have non-gender neutral bathrooms in the middle school? This is like a general question that I don't know the answer to. Okay. We certainly do, and we also have several single stall bathrooms. Okay. School. Okay. So yes, there's one. The main for the middle floor of that building is a gender specific. It's a gender specific bathroom, and then there's a single bathroom, two on the middle floor and one on the top floor. Great. All That's helpful. Thank you. I, I was going to ask a clarifying question along the same lines. Emma, you refer to gender neutral bathrooms, um, and then you refer to women feeling safe. And I just wanted to check that, um, like, we're thinking of gender neutral bathrooms as a piece of progress. Are we having situations where women don't feel safe using the gender neutral bathrooms? Or is that. I think that would be a good question for me to ask my peers about because I do not know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I mean, I have two daughters in the high school, as you well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, and I haven't heard that from either of them. And I feel like they said some, I don't know if they even know which bathrooms are assigned gender and which aren't. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you ask around. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. So, my superintendent report was all about snow days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we started early. We started early, yes, because it's my first year of superintendency, so why wouldn't we start <laughs> early? <laughs> Record snowfall in November. Just special for you. I know, just for me. So, I just wanted to make sure I know as board members, you are probably asked about snow days quite a bit and how they are called, or I'm guessing, anyway. So, I wanted to make sure that you all had the process for just how those snow days are called um, in front of you so you can refer to. So I know Ryan had some questions. Do you want to pose them publicly, Ryan, or? or? Right, I think at the end of one of our last board meetings, we were expecting snow soon, and you know, we talked about what's different in the communities, and you know, in the 706 process and that transition year, like we theoretically said, you know, maybe we can have some schools closed, some schools open, but then it sounds to me that wasn't necessarily possible. So it was really just kind of how does that decision fall out across the district of, doesn't make sense. So I think it's possible. I think it's tricky. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to avoid it at all costs, or as many costs as I possibly can. The reason why is we currently have 15 students from Roxbury who come into Montpelier. So if we, let's just say hypothetically, we close Roxbury, which I would assume that Roxbury transportation from Roxbury to Montpelier is too safe, or is too unsafe right. for those kids to travel. We're making that statement. So they don't come to school. Right. Um, if that happens, there's a few things with that. One, how are we getting them their education for the day? Because their peers are getting learning for the day, right? So that's a, that's a conundrum, right? Which is it a huge deal for one day, but it is if it starts talking about three, four, five days, um, and then you start mixing, what if they don't make the student days that they have to make for the state? What if they don't get to 178 days? And then we have two teacher contracts now, but we'll have one teacher contract, so I, some teachers will need more work dates according to contract than others. It just gets really sticky fast. So I would like to keep it as one district. Um, as much as humanly possible. Right. I think I shared with you also the last few years, year. Roxbury has had less, less snow, snow days than Montpelier. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't see run. it being an issue, but it has come up I and know. people have asked. And yeah. it's like, how does that play out across the district in the future? So. And luckily so far, um, while the first snow day, um, the major draw was Roxbury. I think Montpelier probably could have gone with a delay, um, but Roxbury couldn't have. Um, it's just, it was cleaner to do the whole thing. The second time, when I made the call, I said to Michelle, I think that UES was the one who didn't have power yeah. when I made the call around snow days. So, um, and it turned out that Roxbury was impassable that day anyway. So, and much of, much of Montpelier was as well. So it turned out easier for that day. But it's not an easy, I'd like to keep it as we're one district. And that's pretty common across, across the state. That's not unique to us, that it would be one district. 
So you commented, it's in your report, how you decide, and I have it in front of me. If somebody watching wanted to know where they could find this, where would they find it? Superintendent's um, in the board packet online, um, and I can do a quick rundown. So very quickly, I'm up quite early that morning, and I'm talking to Brian and Lauren, Brian here in Montpelier, and Lauren and Roxbury about what the roads are looking like. Um, I even had, I had some people from the police station the last snow day emailing me as well with power outage information. Uh, so it's about 4.45 when everybody starts talking to each other. All the regional superintendents are on emails. Um, one common email thread talking about what they're hearing from their road crew, which is really helpful um, because we share roads across districts and so it's really helpful to hear what other people are saying. Um, and. Uh, when, once I start hearing what other people are saying and what my road crew is saying in our two communities, that's when I make the decision. It's really based on Brian and Lauren saying, yeah, we can get these roads cleared up or we can't. Um, and Brian and Lauren are? Are the road pe the people who are out looking at the roads. Yep. So it's, I make the call, but it's really not my call. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that was pretty much the superintendent's report because probably that was what was on my mind when I was writing it for the snow days and I wanted to make sure you all had that, that information of how those days are called. Um, and I can say to the public that I do take requests if you want me to give any, any student expectations on my next call, I take requests. So if anybody wants to stick one in there for their particular kid, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Anything else? No. Yeah, perfect. Right um, so I think it's bunch of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Before I get started, does anybody need a hard copy? Not unless it's changed. But we'll it this is kind of yeah. hard. It is not. All right, well, while they're working, I'm going to go ahead and get started by um, first off saying uh, I, I wanted to show some appreciation for my colleagues who are all supporting me from right over here. Um, they make building a budget as easy as it possibly can be. It's not an easy thing to do, but um, we have a great team and uh, we work together on staffing um, and they put together their budget input and send it to me and they always give me all the information that I need to be able to put these slides together so I appreciate the work of my colleagues. Um, I will throw a couple caveats out. One I mentioned to a few of you, I have just driven back from a two-day conference talking about statewide financial system and chart of accounts, which is not exactly the most uplifting two days of my life. So I may not be at the top of my game, but I'm going to give it a college try. Um, the other caveat is this is 27 slides. I've got 30 minutes. Ain't going to happen. But I will do as good as possible at staying on time. What would help is if, as I'm going through this, if you're coming up with questions, if you could jot them down and yep. hit me at the end. Potentially, I will answer the question as we go along, so it might save some time there as well. Yeah, just two quick comments on that. One, we're starting five minutes early, so there will be time. Second, we have uh, more discussion budgeted in the time. And third, we thus far have a relatively low public turnout, so we'll probably have even more time. So there's plenty of time for questions. So and for those of you who have gone through this before, you know this first budget presentation is the most challenging one because we go through everything. After this first one, it goes a lot faster because we're only talking about changes and things like that. So strap in and we'll get going. Um, here's just a quick outline of what I'm going to be covering, so I don't need to talk about much here, except the second to the last bullet there, tax rates may change dramatically. I'm looking like a genius because they already have. Um, I will be briefing you on some new numbers based on new data that's already come out. And there will be new data that keeps coming out. 
So um, we'll go over that and we will update as briefings go along. So for context, obviously we focus a lot on staffing because that's where the majority of the budget is, um, salaries and benefits. So we talk about staffing as a group, we make decisions as a group. Um, we also obviously talk a lot about student needs because after all, that's why we're here. Um, in the back of our minds, we're sensitive to, the, to tax implications for the community. Um, so we always are thinking about are we really needing to add this and add that and you know what are some potential offsets um, the last thing under themes is we last year we added a capital plan into the budget and incorporated that in um, this year it's still there but we are probably going to have it as a separate fund so it would be a separate article and it those funds would then be able to roll over from year to year um, some state factors Internet sales tax has filled the Ed Fund shortfall, so while that may not be good news to us individually, it was great news to the Ed Fund. And as a result, the um, dollar yield that is set at a state level didn't need to go down. It actually is going to go up. And, and what that means is if the yield goes up, the tax rates go down. So that was very good news. Um, health rates, um, not so good news are increasing 11.8%, which is a large increase for the second year in a row. Um, that has been offset by us reducing our assumption for how much people are going to utilize their health reimbursement arrangements. So we're no longer assuming that everybody is going to use 100% of their health reimbursement arrangement money. Um, the other thing that's kind of good news is there's no clawback. If you remember two years ago, the state took money from us and said, well, they didn't take money from us. Instead of giving us all our money, they held back some and said, well, with these new health plans, you should be saving money. So we're not going to give you all the money that we planned on giving you. That happened last year. It happened this year. It's no longer going to happen next year. So that's $65,000 that we don't have to worry about covering in the bottom line. Local factors, uh, you can read them all there. You know we, we, as a merged district, got an eight cent tax incentive last year that drops two cents every year. In essence, what it means is our tax rate goes up two cents every year now that we've cashed in on the eight cents. Um, enrollment, we'll talk about later on. We'll talk about staffing. Um, the budget does include, as of right now, additional busing for Main Street Middle School. Um, there are a few different capacity building initiatives within the budget some relating to foreign language, social emotional learning, equity. Um, this is the first year that we had to absorb the, the um, bond principle, the $4.9 million bond. We paid interest last year. This year we have to pay the principal for the first time. Um, as a result, we knew that was coming. So in FY19, we had a lot of one-time project money in there that we knew we could cut out to absorb that cost this year. Um, we did reduce a lot of those one-time project costs. We didn't go all the way down to the level that we yes. initially thought, but we did come down significantly, I think $167,000 from um, 19 to 20. Um, to try to make up for that difference that we didn't make up, uh, you know, we were going to come down to like 250 and we only came down to 167. So to make up for that difference, we were proposing to use some fund balance as a revenue source in the FY20 budget. That way it would really basically bring us all the way down to where we initially thought we would be on one-time project costs. That's something we can talk about later, whether we should use fund balance or should not. Um, reduced tuition costs, that's tuition in a couple of areas. The big one is Roxbury 9th through 12th students. Um, the amount that we need to budget for next year is significantly less than the amount we budgeted this year. <coughs> One reason is because we actually are coming in under budget this year. There are kids that have decided to go to tech schools, so we have to pay tech tuition, not high school tuition. There are kids that are living with a different parent in a different town, so instead of paying tuition, they're now resident students at Northfield or Barry or U32. So we had a lot less kids this year, and that translates into a lot less kids next year, too. Um, also, private pre-K is lower. 
uh, outside placement costs are lower based on student needs. The unknowns, um, equalized pupil count, you know that that has a lot to do with tax rates. Um, last year we got initial pupil count on December 12th. I'm not um, optimistic that we're going to get a, a, a pupil count on December 12th. And if we do, I'm not optimistic that it's going to be correct. There are a lot of problems with the statewide longitudinal data system. So people aren't getting good data to the state, which means they're not going to be able to give us good pupil counts, I don't think. Um, as an example, Burlington, South Burlington don't have data in. Those are two big districts, and without that data, it makes it hard to think that we're going to get an accurate pupil count. So that may be an unknown for a while, and when we do get a number, it may not hold. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The dollar yield and non-residential tax rate, the tax commissioner letter did come out. Um, I got it Monday. I've been out of town, so your briefing isn't updated, but I will tell you what the impact is. Um, that does still have to be set by law, though. So it's probably as good as it's going to get until after the town meeting day, um, but it's not set by law yet. Common level of appraisal, I think we got that around the middle of December last year, so that should be out soon. I did make some assumptions. Hopefully pretty close, maybe a little conservative, but we'll see. Um, revenues, and when I say revenues, I'm talking about non-tax revenues, which you'll see in the tax rate calculation how that plays out. There are some unknowns there. Special education, some of those revenues, the AOE gives us, we haven't gotten that yet. Small schools grant for Roxbury, we haven't gotten that number yet. Um, we should get those probably around the middle of the month. Transportation aid. The last two years, I haven't gotten a number in time for the budget, so I have a, an estimate plugged in, which is probably going to be as good as it gets. Career Center six semester average, that's for kids who go to tech centers. And we don't pay a tuition like we do for kids who go to a high school. Um, career Center tuition is based on a three-year average to try to level out any spikes that you might see. So when you pay for tech tuition, you're paying for an average of the number of kids over the past three years. Um, I don't have that count yet. Uh, it shouldn't swing dramatically because it is a three-year average. Um, I made an assumption of 11 kids. I think this year we're at 9.99, so maybe it'll come down. Um, health reimbursement arrangement, I mentioned that a little earlier. Um, so. If we give, say, a single teacher $2,100 to go against health costs, in FY19, we assumed they were going to use that full $2,100. In FY20, we're assuming that as a district, those people who are getting $2,100 in total will average about 90% of that $2,100. They won't all spend every dime of it. That's the assumption. We still don't even have a full year under our belt. So next year we can make a more informed decision, but I think 90% is probably safe. Uh, this slide, the top there, just is a quick preview of um, the numbers, and it compares FY18. Remember, FY18 was two separate districts. Roxbury and Montpelier kind of added together as best we could. 19 was our first unified budget, and 20 is what we're proposing. Uh, you'll see that the, about the middle of that chart, you'll see the total budget is $24,030,000. That's about a 2.5% increase over FY19. And uh, just as a comparison point, FY19 was an 8% increase over 18. Um, so that is pretty good. Um, Non-tax revenues are estimated, hopefully conservatively estimated. If that number goes up and spending goes down, tax rates go down. Um, education spending right now is just over 20.1 million. That represents a 3.2% increase over la uh, 19 as compared to a 6.5% increase from 18 to 19. Um, you may remember that the board gave guidance to try to limit the increase to a 4% increase, and we're at 3.2, which was a, a very good surprise. And I will tell you that we did not go back to administration and everybody else and say, you have a target of X. We built this budget, and it just came out this way. So there weren't artificial constraints. Um, everybody knew the challenges that were going on, so I think people were realistic. 
that nobody was artificially constrained when they built their budgets. Equalized pupil count is probably the biggest unknown, and I talked about that. You'll see right now I'm going from 1205 or 1225 down to 1220. Our pupils, our um, enrollment is increasing, so you might think that that should go up, and I hope it does, but I'm just not sure. With equalized pupils, it's a very complicated um, calculation. And then at the very end, there's a statewide equalizing ratio get, that gets applied. And I have no idea what that ratio might be. So you'd never know until the end what's going to happen to your numbers. Um, I would hope 1220 is conservative. If that goes up, spending per pupil goes down, tax rate goes down. And hopefully we'll know a little bit more in the coming weeks. Um, we instituted a capital plan last year at 250. We're proposing a capital plan at 260 for FY20, and this time it would be a separate article and a separate fund. So enrollment projections, just to kind of, if you haven't seen this slide before, um, K through 4 does not include Roxbury. And the reason why is because if we rolled them in when we do class size analysis, it would really skew the numbers. Um, so K through 4 is just the Montpelier schools. Actually, this whole thing is Montpelier schools because Roxbury students are feeding into um, Montpelier schools in starting in fifth grade. Um, so, or, yeah, fifth grade, sixth grade? Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. So fifth through twelfth actually includes Roxbury students as they um, grandparent, as the grandparenting wears off and they come into our schools. It's hard to see, but there's a darker kind of uh, square that gets bigger, or rectangle that gets bigger every year. That's as students are transitioning in. So in FY 2018-19, you see 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders are in the middle school. Next year, that adds to ninth grade. The next year, there's 10th graders, 11th graders, 12th graders. So in FY 23, all Roxbury students in grades um, 5 through 12 will be in either Main Street Middle School or uh, Montpelier High School. So that's a little bit about the chart. Two things to kind of call out. You might see kindergarten numbers and think those are kind of hokey. They're going all over the place. The model is based on birth rate data, and it's a little smoke and mirrors to try to figure out what's going to happen four or five years after a kiddo is born. So don't put a whole lot of stock in the kindergarten column. You know, those do change a lot, uh, especially you'll see in FY 23, 55 kids. I'm sure that's a low number, but it's just how the model kicked it out based on birth data. Um, the other thing to notice is at the very bottom, you'll see we still have increasing enrollment every year, going from 1,072 projected or actual this year up to 1,212 12 in 2023. Some of that is because we have additional Roxbury kids coming in, but one year's worth each year is not making up these numbers. I mean, you're talking, what, five to eight kids, and you're seeing increases of 19, 64, 28, 29, 19. So that's more than just Roxbury kids coming into Montpelier schools. I do think that after 2023, we should start seeing some kind of leveling off. But increased enrollment across the board. This uh, slide shows kind of how that translates into class size analysis. Um, even though we have increasing enrollment, we are not proposing adding any classroom teachers until probably FY22. So the 21-22 year is the first year you see a red highlight in a cell. If it's red highlighted, that means that is at the point where we now are over our max class size. In FY19 or FY20 and FY21, you'll see some yellow. That means we're getting close to max class size. We're within one student. So we are getting close in a few areas, especially 6th grade, 7th and 8th grade in the next couple years. And then in FY22, 6th, 7th, 8th, and then you start seeing it in the high school. So we will have to add, but we're only talking about probably one or two teachers over this span of time as the increased pupil count goes up. So I don't think spending per pupil is going to go through the roof. I think both are going to go kind of in the same line. 
Um, Roxbury, my apologies to Roxbury. This is not a highly complex um, slide with a very difficult algorithm. Um, all we're looking at is basically assuming if there's five fifth graders or five first graders, there's going to be five second graders next year. Um, the numbers just aren't there to try to do a complicated model. Uh, but you can see we're looking at like 29 to 32 kids is pretty stable in Roxbury K-4. Um, that isn't a typo if you notice that 11 kindergartners going to eight first graders. That is true. Three kiddos moved out. I double checked that. But other than that, usually you have pretty stable transition from year to year. So staffing. There's only one page of staffing adjustments that we're proposing this year. And on this one page, half of these are really shifts. They're not really increases or decreases. Um, at the district level, we are proposing, and we've talked about this before, a human resources coordinator. So that would be a, an additional full-time person coming in. Um, if you're familiar with the district, you know the workload has gone up. There's Family Medical Leave Act issues. There's Fair Labor Standard Act issues. There's new health plans and HRAs that are coming on board. And then next year, you've got statewide negotiation for health plans. So that's still going to be changing. Um, so, and there's a lot of work that we need to do with job descriptions and that kind of thing. If you're familiar with the district, you know there's three people that basically do a piece of this job. So it's not real efficient, especially from an employee or a consumer's perspective. This would really help centralize that, help be more efficient. And it would also free up some time so that somebody can start focusing a little more on transportation coordination as we add more busing into this district. Um, custodial, that's a decrease of a half-time position. It's not a real, it's not a cut, it's a vacancy. We had a half-time person that we added in the FY19 budget. We haven't filled that, and we think we can go without filling it. So it's not a cut. It's, it's a cut to the budget, but not a cut to people. The next two lines are those shifts that I talked about. Shifting partial FTEs from title funds, from consolidated federal grant money, into our local money. And you do that whenever you want to make sure that if title funds go away, these people don't go away. Um, so I certainly wouldn't want to see 0.17 of Mike Berry go away because we lose title funds. So we want to shift that and make sure those are sustainable positions that we don't end up having to cut at some point. Um, that takes you down to union, and for union we have an interventionist coach, coach that's a shift from title funds to general fund budget. You may wonder why it's even in here. It's in here because it's not an increase to the expense budget, but it's an increase to ed spending because you don't have an offsetting revenue if we take it from federal grants to local budget. So that's why it's in here. Um, the shift under Union Elementary School is needed because Union Elementary School won't qualify for title funds next year. So we don't want that position to go away. The only way to keep it is to shift it. Um, the last position that we're adding is also at Union. It's a social emotional learning coordinator. Um, Early on in this, prog uh, in this process, I think I told the board we were thinking about adding another special educator. Instead of doing that, we're adding a social emotional learning coordinator. And that would basically be to help institute a model to integrate kids back into classrooms. And that would help avoid costly outside placements. But more importantly, it would, it would focus on teaching social and self-regulation skills so that we can get those kiddos back into the classroom because we all know that what's most important is high quality first instruction in the classroom. So this would be, if you're following along with MTSS, this would be MTSS level three to get you back to level one. Um, and we think it's very important work to do. So now moving on, we get into numbers which I love. So we're going to talk about expenses by both program and category. And when I say program, I mean like general education, special education, co-curricular. When I say category, I mean the type of expense, like salaries, benefits, tuition. We'll start off by looking at it both ways. A couple of briefings in, we'll probably just look, focus in on one or the other to save some time and confusion. 
So as we do this look, I just wanted to point out on this chart again, the number that we're looking at is this 240446. That's what I'm going to be tracking to on the next five or six slides. So first, by program. Nearly 60% of the budget relates entirely to direct instruction, meaning um, general education, special education, uh, career center tuition, and it would be even higher if you roll in, say, speech into the equation, which is broken out separately. Most of the programs that you can see, hoping, hopefully you can read the, everything from there, most of these programs are pretty much self-explanatory. A couple that maybe call out are like buildings and grounds. You may wonder what's in there. Well, the capital fund is part of buildings and grounds. Um, utilities, electricity, heating oil, that's in buildings and grounds. Um, safety, that includes our school resource officer. It includes bus aides, uh, crossing guards. Um, principal offices slash special services administration, that's your principal's budget and you know the administrative offices of the principals, it's the special ed director's um, uh, administrative budget, that's where that is. Um, fund transfer is another one that you might not know what that means. Fund transfer for us is one thing and one thing only. It's the money that we have to transfer over to food service to cover any deficit. That's the only piece of food service you see in our budget because other than that, food service is an enterprise. They have expenses, revenues that offset. The only thing that you see in this budget is what we supplement to food service to make sure that they are breaking even completely. The next chart is really just to show I have skills at building charts. Um, this is just a bar chart that shows from year to year what's going on. So you can see increases and decreases just visually. I'm not going to spend any time on this because the next slide is the one that gives you the words to explain why the increases or decreases are happening. So it's a lot of words. I'm not going to read them all to you, but I'm going to try to hit some of the highlights and some of maybe the more complicated things. Um, and I'll start with the most difficult one to explain. In general education, in FY19, there was a $170,000 expense that was a transfer out from our funds in the general fund to triple E, which is preschool, special education preschool. The reason we had to do that is because triple E was considered a separate fund and it never had nearly enough revenue to cover expenses. So we would show a transfer out in general education. We no longer have to do that because Tripoli is really just part of the general fund now as part of this statewide uniform chart of accounts. So that expense goes away. Um, so that's part of the reason why there's a decrease in general education. On the flip side, it shows up as an increase in special ed because special education used to get that as a revenue, kind of a transfer in to cover Tripoli costs. And they're not going to get that anymore. So, it's not really a big swing, it's just a swing between general ed and special ed. You would expect special ed to be a decrease. You can see it's like a 1% increase. It's, it really is a decrease in special ed, other than that dynamic of this transfer in, transfer out, that we don't have to do anymore. Um, so in general ed, some of the other stuff, tuition, the Roxbury tuition, or Tuition for Roxbury students that are 9-12 is much lower, as I referenced earlier. Outside placement costs, um, well, that's special ed, sorry. Pre-K tuition is lower. Um, another dynamic that you're going to notice is that we pulled out transportation costs from some of these areas and booked them under transportation. The reason for that is there's a separate function called transportation. Anything to do with busing should be there. It wasn't. Field trips were under general education, even though the busing piece of that probably should have been down under transportation. We fixed that in this budget, so some of those shifts are going on. You'll see that in general ed, you'll see it in co-curricular co and athletics as well, a shift of, of funds or requirements. Um, special ed, I talked about the fact that it would be a big decrease if not for this transfer in that they're no longer going to get. The reason why it would be a big decrease is outside placement costs are way down based on student needs. 
it's always a crapshoot. You have to go by what the student needs are. Some years it's going to go up. This year it happens to go down based on what we're seeing. Contracted services is also going down for things like OTPT, autism services, those kinds of things. And once again, it's purely based on student needs and what we saw as we built a service plan, or as Mary built a service plan. Um, career center tuition, that's showing up about a 15% increase for two reasons. One, I'm assuming there's going to be a little bit of an uptick in the six semester average. And two, um, the two tech centers we typically send kids to, Central Vermont and Randolph, I think it is, um, their tuition we anticipate is going to go up. In actuality, that number is going to go up even higher the next time you see this presentation because Central Vermont gave me a number one day, and the next day they gave me a number that was $1,000 higher than the number the day before. So that's got to be rolled into here. But I'm hoping that the six semester average number is lower, so that higher tuition hopefully will be offset by a lower number of students. Um, Co-curricular and athletics, uh, even though we added some advisors for co-curriculars like Equity Alliance, <coughs> Racial Justice, and the conversation, which you just mentioned earlier, um, the cost came down. And the reason why it came down is because we shifted all the transportation, all the busing costs out of this line and put it under transportation. So there really is an increase in co-curriculars um, and athletics, but it looks like it's a decrease because we shifted busing costs out. Uh, some other things to point out, student support. The reason for the increase there mostly is that social emotional learning coordinator that I talked about. Um, staff support, there's a fairly big percentage increase there. The big drivers are the world language immersion study that we're going to do. Um, and there's also, not an exciting one, but phones has to go up by a significant amount because we used to get E-rate money to um, offset the the cost of phones, like a discount. Um, it, phones are no longer um, considered reimbursable through the E-rate process. So we have to cover the full cost of phones now. So that's another driver for that increase. Another one is um, equity stipends that we have in place. And I, I might talk more about that later. But really, we're talking about a, system, a systematic way to build capacity through kind of a train the trainer model. Instead of just bringing somebody in to do a PD you know, event, we're going to have, say, three or four, I think three, maybe, uh, folks that are trained on equity, that become kind of the champions district-wide, that will train other people, that will basically systematize um, equity professional development for the district. Um, let's see what else. Superintendent and school board is pretty flat. The reason there is um, I took credit for this in the business office last year, so I'll give Libby credit for it this year. <laughs> New hire savings. Uh, so thank you, Libby. Um, business services, the big increase there is related to that's where we plugged in the HR coordinator. Building and grounds, big decrease there. As I mentioned, we inflated one-time program costs in the FY19 budget, fully intending to back that out this year. We did back it out. Not quite as much as we initially planned. Um, Andrew looked at requirements with the principals. We didn't want to bring it all the way down to you know prior to prior levels before the merger, but we did bring it down significantly, um, with the hope that maybe we can bring it down the rest of the way next year. But we'll see what the needs of the facility are. Um, safety, not a big dollar amount, but a good percentage increase. That's because we're doing a resupply of things like cones, fencing, things that, that uh, Andrew has taken an inventory of that we want to re resupply. Um, transportation, a large increase there for two reasons. One, as I mentioned, field trips, co-curricular, busing costs are now put down in this line. Of course, the other big one is adding busing for the middle school. Um, debt service, I talked about the fact that this is the first year that we're going to have to pay that principal on that $4.9 million bond. So that's a big uptick this one year that we have to absorb. From here on out, you won't see that. It will actually drop a little bit each year. Fund transfers, um, not a huge dollar amount, but percentage-wise, a huge increase in food service to cover potential deficit. The reason there, I think everybody supports the idea of trying to, be, uh, trying to make a more livable wage 
for food service employees. And also, um, we're kind of infamous for having just under the number of hours to get benefits. And we don't want to do business that way. So if we need somebody for six hours a day, then we're going to hire them for six hours a day, and we're going to give them the benefits that they should get for six hours a day. So we're anticipating because of that, we're going to see maybe a bigger deficit for the first year or two. As Jim you know, continues on down the road, you know, maybe we'll see some efficiencies be able to be driven from that. Maybe we'll see higher um, participation rates. But it's an initial investment that we feel it's important to make. I wish I had a commercial break. <laughs> You're doing fantastic. You are You're doing ridiculously fine. impressive, Grant. Just, Keep going. Just need to take some oxygen. <laughs> um, so now expenses by category. So now we're looking at it, as I said, salaries, benefits, that kind of thing. So if you look at the numbers, you'll see that nearly 72% of the budget is salaries and benefits. So that's why, obviously, we spend a lot of money agonizing over staffing levels. Um, professional services, I'm going to give you some examples of what some of these things are because you might not be able to translate. So professional services are things like OTPT, autism services, psyche valves, the foreign language immersion study would be under here, um, professional development, audit, legal, uh, what am I missing? Uh, some flexible pathway services to get into instruction. So if there's virtual learning or online courses, that would be in here. Um, visiting artists, those kinds of things are professional services. Purchase services are things like repair and maintenance. So when we renovate a classroom, that kind of thing. Uh, the capital plan is all in there. Copiers, that kind of thing, is in purchase services. Contracted services is your busing, um, travel and conference expenses, phones, printing, postage, advertising, uh, property and liability insurance. Tuition, that seems like a no-brainer, but just to show what all that encompasses, it's tuition for Roxbury kids that are grandparented in, uh, pre private preschool, it's outside placements. Um, am I missing anything? I think that's, oh, tech tuition is also part of that. And then you, we've talked about the fund transfer that might be one that you wouldn't have recognized before today. The bar chart is showing you know, things that you might want to visually see and then go to the next page to see what the words are to back it up. So, like, for example, salaries is an increase, tuition is a decrease. Those things are all explained on the next chart. Most of these things I've already discussed, it's just they're in a different, different bucket. So now when I talk about those positions, they're all in under the salary line instead of HRs under business office and you know, the different categories. So now all those positions are under salaries that I talked about. Um, health insurance, we broke that out separately because it's a big piece of benefits. Um, I talked about the health rates going way up, but 90% utilization of HRAs, that assumption brings it back down some. So it's about where you'd hope to be at about 3%. Benefits less health, so we're talking about social security, teacher retirement, federal grant assessment, uh, municipal retirement. So for example, the HR coordinator would most likely fall under Beamers, so we have to add that in. When we talk about teacher retirement, you may think, well, we don't pay for visitors. Well, we do for some. If we have a new teacher, there's an assessment amount that we have to pay for teachers who are new to visitors to help make sure visitor stays healthy. So for a new teacher, we do have to pay an assessment amount of about I mean, $1,500. The other time we pay for visitors is when we're paying for somebody using federal funds. So if somebody's position is funded by IDEA B or a title grant, we have to pay visitors from that grant, um, which hurts because this year it's 15.175, I think, percent. That's a good chunk of the money that you're getting you have to put towards visitors. Next year, that percentage goes all the way up to 19.125. So 19% is a huge amount of money that you're paying towards visitors. But and visitors for the people listening is? The Vermont State Teacher Retirement System. So it's teacher's retirement. Um, 
And it's only those two pieces that come out of this budget. The rest is budgeted and paid for at the state level. Um, let's see what else. Professional services is down due to lower special ed services that we anticipate. Um, purchase services is down because of the one-time project costs that we pulled out of facilities. Contract services is largely due to adding busing for middle school. Tuition, I think I beat that horse. It's grandparented tuition for Roxbury. Outside placements, private pre-K. The private pre-K, just to put a number on that, we budgeted for 120 kids at private preschools times 3,000 some odd dollars. We're at about 100, and it seems like that's where we're gonna stay. So we're dropping that level down. That's why private preschool is down. The rate is certainly going up, but instead of 120, we're thinking 100 is probably reasonable. So I'm not being overly conservative for once in my life. <laughs> Um, supplies is about where you'd expect it to be, a little bit of a shift from equipment because we're trying to make sure that unless you're buying something that is, you know, significant dollar amount as a unit cost, you shouldn't call it an equipment item, you should put it in supplies. Um, utilities, that's a pleasant surprise that it's only about a 1.7% increase. Um, electricity is pretty flat. We looked at what we budgeted in electricity for 19 and what we think we need for 20. It's pretty level, so you know we were able to kind of offset some of the other increases there. Um, equipment, not a huge dollar amount, but a huge percentage increase, and a lot of that is because um, a little bit of sloppy work last year when we shifted <coughs> um, furnishings, uh, furniture costs, we shifted it from the facilities budget into the principal's budget. And I wasn't closely watching to make sure everybody caught that, and so we missed it in a few places. Like, the high school here is trying to backfill for furniture because we missed budgeting that. And so we put it back in here. So that's why it looks like there's a big increase. Um, at Union Elementary, I think we only budgeted like $800 in FY19, and typically that's $7,500 in there. So those are added in there. You also see that, um, there's some high school PE equipment that we're adding in. You know, we're going to have a better space in the fitness area with the bond. We don't want to have, you know, cut a ribbon and then have people walk in and see treadmills that are held together with duct tape. So we have some treadmills. We have some squat racks that are built into this budget. Um, let's see, dues and fees. It's it's small dollars. I had the the reasons in the comments block. Principal and interest. Talked about that, $4.9 million bond principal. Fund transfers, we talked about food service. So there you have it. Moving on to revenues. There's still a lot of unknowns. I highlighted those in yellow. Um, actually, I got a little sloppy because there's at least one other one that should be yellow. Tech on behalf should be yellow because I don't know that until I know the six semester average. So. I made some educated guesses at these items that are in yellow, but we should get better numbers for the potential uh, exclusion of transportation aid because I just don't know if I'm going to get better number. Um, if, you, if you're looking at um, education spending, that's basically where we balance revenues with expenses, and that's what's going to drive what the tax rate looks like. Everything other than those top two lines are considered non-tax revenues. So whenever I say that you have your expenses minus your non-tax revenues, everything on that list except those first two lines are considered non-tax revenues. So if these numbers go up, that means I'm subtracting out more money from your total expense, which means your education spending is lower, spending per pupil is lower, tax rate is lower. So hopefully these numbers all go in the upward direction. Um, special ed intensive, that's basically, if you've been around for a while, you know that when you have money spent towards special ed requirements, you get a, about a 56% reimbursement from the state. So that number is basically looking at what we're spending times about 56%. Um, some of the other special ed numbers are going to depend on factors that the AOE comes up with and sends back. Um, just hitting on a few other items, you'll see a couple like IDB, title funds, EPSDT, and Medicaid 
all of those, the revenue amounts will match exactly an expense amount. So if I'm going to spend X number of dollars um, towards social workers using Medicaid funds, the revenue is exactly that same amount. So those offset each other. Same thing for, like I said, Medicaid title funds. Uh, if you skip down to tuition, that is tuition revenue now. We're looking at who people are paying us to have kids come here. Um, that would be pretty much level with the exception of we've now included in there when we have to charge for special ed excess costs. So if a student comes here, we charge X number of dollars, 16000 for tuition. But if they're receiving additional services, we also charge for that. If it's above and beyond, we will charge for that. We didn't use the budget for that, and we're trying to be more um, all fully, fully encompassing all these revenues. So that's why there's an increase there. Other than that, we're pretty flat. I'm assuming that the kids that we have here that are tuitioned in are going to stay here. It may come in higher if we get additional kids next year, but I don't want to count on that. Um, balance forward. So down near the bottom, balance forward, 87500 That's what I initially plugged in because basically when Andrew and I looked at one-time project costs, I was hopeful that we were going to be $87,500 lower than what we came in at. When we didn't hit that target, I figured, no problem. We'll push in fund balance revenue, so it basically is like we came all that way down. The problem with doing that, then, is next year, when you take out that eighty-seven five, it's like increasing your expenses. So next year, we would absolutely have to take out that eighty-seven five in one-time costs if we're going to take out this revenue so that both go out and there's no impact. If the tax rate's looking good, we may decide not to use any fund balance there. That way next year we can bring down one-time project costs a little bit more and we don't have to reduce any revenues. So that would help us out to, uh, to offset that two cent tax incentive that we're gonna lose out on. So the 87.5 is something I'd like you all to kind of put in the back of your head so that by the end of the budget, you're telling me, yes, put it in, no, don't put it in, or maybe we're going to make a different number, like 50,000, or call it in the middle. I think it's probably prudent to see how some other numbers come out first, like our equalized pupil count and our CLA. And we may decide that, hey, the tax rate's looking pretty good, so let's not throw this in here this year. Let's shoot that bullet next year. Um, IEP Medicaid, just one last thing to point out. You'll see that that's a fairly big increase percentage-wise. You know, Mary and her administrative assistant, Spooky, have been on a great job um, putting in for Medicaid reimbursement and getting Medicaid money in. And we get to roll that over from year to year, and we've built up a pretty good amount of money. We use that to pay for 25% of each social worker. We think we can bump that up to 30%, which then reduces the amount that we're paying out of the general fund. And we think if we just do a 5% increment, we can sustain that for several years. So that's why that revenue is going up, and that helps us out on the general fund side. Capital plan, now we're, we're rolling downhill. This will go pretty fast. Um, this is about 1% of the overall budget. So 260000 is what we, we said we were going to do for FY20. And what we said we were going to do, do with it was uh, renovate two bathrooms at Main Street Middle School. So that's still in there. That's still what we say we're going to do for 20. The other years, don't get too excited about. I think you should take comfort in the fact that there is a plan, a multiple year plan, but we have time to tweak those numbers and those requirements. And Andrew, I mean, he's done a great job jumping in, but I think as he's got some more time under his belt, he may decide next year, I think I might want to change this around a little bit. We have time to do that. The only thing we're locked into is what we say we're going to do in 20. So if there's questions about this later, Andrew's here, he can, he can address them, but I want to work through the rest of these slides. The tax rates, I don't want you to get too excited about these because things are changing and can change dramatically. What you should take from this is on the left side, we can follow the math signs. This tells you how the tax rates are calculated. If you didn't know, this gives you the math behind it, but the factors are going to change. 
The dollar yield, as many of you know, the dollar yield, the tax commissioner came out with a number, and instead of 10 to 20, the number is 10666. So if you want to jot that down, the dollar yield number or the, the tax commissioner's recommendation is 10,666. What that means is if you go all the way to the bottom and you see that 1.729 under Montpelier, that number would be 1.653. That's a huge drop, just based on one factor changing. As a matter of fact, that, that's like seven out of the 12 cents or something like that, eight out of the 12 cents. Um, if you're in Roxbury, don't get too excited, your number didn't change. Um, the reason why is because as you're getting tax incentives for merger, Roxbury's tax rate can't drop by more than 5% from one year to the next. So that equalized rate of 1.654, it can't be lower than that. We could cut our budget by $5 million. Roxbury's tax rate is still going to be that number. Conversely, we could add a million dollars to the tax rate, or to the expense budget, and it probably wouldn't be enough to increase that either. So Roxbury, your tax rate is going to be this, basically no matter what we do in the budget. And I shouldn't say, I mean, things might change, factors might change, equalized pupil numbers. But even if those things change, my guess is that 1.654 is going to be the Roxbury number. Um, equalized people count hopefully will change and make the, uh, the Montpelier side better. The CLA numbers might change. Um, you can see that for CLA I've estimated 90% for Montpelier and 100% for uh, Roxbury. Last year Montpelier's CLA dropped 1.9%. I'm saying it could drop 2.3%. Hopefully that's conservative. If it doesn't drop that much, then the tax rate is better. Um, Roxbury, the CLA dropped 3.9% last year. I'm showing about a 3% drop this year. So that probably will be close, but we'll see in a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, I think that's about it. Once again, if you live in Montpelier, don't get too excited about these numbers yet. I mean, there's a lot still to go as far as unknowns go. This is yet another one, um, the residential tax rate implications. So this is where we say if you have a house that's worth $100,000, this is the, imp the impact. Instead of $128, that number would be 52. And that's just because the dollar yield went up. So it's decreased by a factor of more than two. So the numbers, if you want to write them down as of right now, it's 52, 104, 156, instead of 128, 256, and 384. Obviously, Roxbury hasn't changed. Hopefully, those will get even better as we go along. Non-residential tax rate, you know, we put it in here because not everybody is a resident. Not everybody has residential property. It's nothing to get excited about as far as the budget is concerned, though, because the school budget has no impact to non-residential tax rate. That is simply a statewide factor divided by CLA. School budget can go up from $10 million or down $10 million, but this won't change. This number on this slide will change, though, because the tax commissioner is recommending 1.58 instead of 1.6 that's on here. So basically, the tax commissioner is recommending a level rate so that means instead of 1.778 for Montpelier, it would be 1.756. Instead of 1.6 for Roxbury, it would be 1.58 until we get a better sale number. The outlook, and this is something we spent a lot of time on last year. I think we should spend a lot of time on it in future budget meetings. The merger incentive, two cents, is going to increase every year because we go from eight to six to four to two to zero. Whenever you drop, or whenever you um, basically lose two cents of incentive, you're really kind of, it's, it's equivalent to maybe adding two hundred and fifty dollars or $300,000 to your budget. So if you want to absorb that two cents, you would have to cut two hundred and fifty dollars to $275,000 to keep that tax rate level estimate. Um, so I'm always thinking about that. So next year, if we want to control the tax rate, where are we going to come up with that? Um, or at least minimize increases. 
Enrollment and staffing shouldn't be too much of a challenge because even though we might have some more staffing, I think we can go another, hopefully another year without adding classroom teachers at least, but our enrollment will go up. So spending per pupil should go down and might be able to accommodate some of that, that dollar amount or that two cents. Um, some expenditures will decrease. 9 through 12 uh, tuition for grand, uh, phasing out grandfather or grandparented um, Roxbury students, I thought that was going to be more like 100 or 150,000 every year. But because of this big drop we have from 19 to 20, it's not going to be as much from 20 to 21. Because there's only, say, three juniors this year, and they will be seniors next year, and then they will go away. That's only three kids times tuition, so it's not as much as you might have thought. So we're looking at maybe a drop of 40, then a drop of 80 and 80. Um, One-time facilities projects, we could drop that $87,500 maybe next year. But if we have fund balance in there that we take away, that's not really going to save you anything. So that's why you need to think about should we use fund balance this year or not. Transportation aid, we're not going to be able to decrease expenses in transportation, but we'll get more money. Transportation aid is about 40% of your transportation costs, but they go back two years. So your FY18 costs tell you how much money you're going to get in FY20. So in FY21, we should see a bump up because we've added some busing costs this year. In FY22, we'll get a big bump if we add Main Street busing in FY20. So if we add $120,000 worth of busing costs in FY20 for middle school, two years later, we'll get $48,000 more in transportation aid. So if you think about it in the long term, you're not really spending $120,000 on busing at the middle school. You're spending 78. I hate doing math in public, but I think that's right. Um, 72. See, I did it wrong. 72. Um, the other thing to think about is bond expenses. Um, construction bond expenses, by their nature, go down every year. But we have a Beamers bond where we bought into the Vermont Municipal Employee Retirement System years ago. The cost of that actually goes up every year until it gets paid off. So one's going down, one's going up. The net is you're going to have a decrease each year, but it's not going to be much. Seven to ten thousand dollars probably. So last year when we showed this slide, there were some pretty big ticket items that we were going to be able to cut in the next year and the next year. It's not as big. There's still some opportunities there, but I do think after going through this budget once, I think. The next time, we, uh, we, when we go through the second cut or the third cut, we may be talking about maybe taking out that fund balance revenue because we may need to be able to recoup that in the next year. But at least we're thinking about future years. The summary, um, as of right now, the increase in that spending is 3.2, which obviously is better than the target that we were set, um, that the board asked us to set. Um, we didn't constrain anybody, so 3.2 to me is great news. Tax rates, I'm going to wait until the next time when we have some better data to get into that. That, finally, my friends, is all I have for you. <laughs> so, I uh, was uh, uh, very helpful. Uh, so, now we're going to take uh, public comment and then we're going to have more discussion. Well. So, uh, any members from the public? Oh, is that why? I can't see any video. Yeah, okay. We've shipped out a little battery mode. Oh, is, is this yours? Yeah, uh, battery's dying. Is there a plug maybe? Or? Give me a plug. It's okay. Um, so, <laughs> if any members of the public want to comment on the presentation, now is the time. All right, um, perfect. Let's uh, open up to board discussion. Uh, questions or comments <coughs> for Grant? Tina. Um, so the social emotional person is not special ed, so no reimbursement. Yes, no. I think that's, um, yeah, it, it's not reimbursable because this would serve as kids that aren't necessarily on an IEP. Well, we put the special ed teacher in. 
Yeah, we moved. Okay. Um, and I think I backed it up with the intensive reimbursement amount. So this is a great conversation. So we initially anticipated hiring a special ed teacher, which would be reimbursable. Yeah. And so it's would expensive. impact that special ed intensive reimbursement dollar amount. But when we shifted and decided this might be the better model to go after to actually attack this issue, I had to re recalculate kind of what I anticipated for revenues in special ed. So it's not a reimbursable position. Can you elaborate on why that decision was made? To, to do a social emotional learning? Because could, could, could we accomplish the same goal with a reimbursable position, I guess is my question. No, no because if you have a child that's struggling with social emotional issues, they might not be on an IEP. Mm -hmm. And so if we hired a special ed teacher, they could only service the child that's on the IEP. So we want to make sure that, and, and there are, social emotional issues are, are, are big right now. And so those, that's kind of where we want to attack things. At least that's my take. So then to be clear, this position is going to have only an impact on one school, right? Not the entire district, not all schools. Right. We're, this start, is designed yeah. for We're starting to target at UES. Um, however, that's not to say that this position couldn't be utilized in the other buildings as well. So you mentioned two pla Oh, can I go on? Go. Yeah. Uh, I got a list. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you mentioned the shift of title funds. So you're, I understand what you're doing. You're assuring those salaries for those people that are not hitched to the title fund. What's, what are you doing with that? What are we doing with? The title fund that you um, use for those. We people. actually are anticipating we might not get quite as much title funds in the future. But we did. <laughs> Classic. Um, <laughs> We looked at the positions that we thought we needed, the highest priority positions, and we also, I think if, let me look at the revenue slide. Here. The other thing is we used to show um, consolidated federal grants as one big bucket, and it's really Title I or Title IIA, right. so I broke that out. But you'll see that um, we budgeted 401495 in, in FY19, and if you add the two numbers in FY20, it's about $36,000 lower. We think we might get less title funds. And that's what they've been threatening for the past five years. So um, it's prudent to not um, overdo that because then you're, you lock yourself into positions that end up having to not be able to hire. So, um, so yeah, there's just a couple fractional pieces that we shifted for the, for the purpose of making sure that we don't have to lose those positions or portions of those positions. The UES one is because we no longer qualify for title funds, so we, if we wanted to keep that position, we had to switch it to general funds. Roxbury qualifies. What's that? Roxbury would qualify. Roxbury does qualify for title one. Okay, I'd love an explanation of the World Language Immersion Study. <laughs> Uh, we're right now, if, should this funding go, go through, our plan is to work uh, collaboratively with a consulting firm, basically, whose job it is to start doing immersion in schools. Um, it's not an easy process. It's not just saying, yes, we will teach Spanish to kindergartners next year. Um, so this is, a, this is a group that worked with Chittenden East Supervisory Union, who now has a language immersion at Jericho Elementary School. It's now K-1. It started at kindergarten last year, and now it's K-1. Next year it will be K-2, with the potential of a second kindergarten adding onto it as well in Richmond. Um, so they have done this. They've worked with this group before. Um, and they led them through the process of how to, how to do it. And my definition of emergent is if I go into that room and they've decided that you're speaking Spanish, that's what they're speaking in that room. Is that correct? Yes. And along with this thought, have you decided which language you're immersing? No, in? we haven't done any conversation around that whatsoever, but they will help us through that process, through all of those decisions. So the, so the money in the budget for this, when somebody asks me, yeah. is for what? 
is to the, work is to work with this group closely. So it's a, a, a program would not be in next year. No. No. Would not There's no guarantee a program would be gathered. Yeah, that, that's where there's some real unclarity there. Have we decided to hire a consultant to cause a program to happen, or have we decided to hire a consultant to study what that might look like? Thank you. We will most likely be going down the road of, of starting an immersion program through working with this consultant. What is the deliverable that we hope to get from the consultant? A plan of... of how you how you open up this or how you start this whole program and um, there's different there's obviously different ways to set up these programs some are full immersion a bunch of states like Delaware uh, Utah. you're gonna ask a question that's too specific for us to answer right now because that well let me ask you my question so um, there are dual language immersion programs and which teach kids English and another language at the same time half and half is this consultant going to look at different options for how we can do this? I would or, imagine. I'm not positive, but I would imagine. Are we going to send out an RFP and see what other organizations might be able to provide us with um, such products? We could. We could. Because $22,000 to one entity that we're familiar with from one school's experience when there, you know, there are a lot of successful programs of this nature going, ar going on around the country. You know, it makes me wonder if we should maybe look to other organizations too. Not to say that this this organization might not rise to the top. We could. Okay. Will this organization or any other that we hire help us plan the finances for this? Yes. So it would help produce a budget that would say, okay, year one you're doing kindergarten. Yes. Next year you're doing first grade, cut and cost you twice as much or something, and next year you're doing so they would plan that out so the deliverable at the end of the year that's what I'm trying to get to for this amount of money is a plan yes which includes the finances of how it might begin the next year mm -hmm. and, and when, when one thing I would correct you on or I would I would yep yeah, I would ahead. think about correct away. is that it's not an addition so it's not adding teachers and teachers for foreign language or for, for language immersion. It's it's using spaces that we have already currently. So let's say if we started in kindergarten, we wouldn't be adding a kindergarten class. One of our current kindergarten classes would be dedicated to language immersion. Right, but as far as I know, we don't have a kindergarten teacher that could teach full day in another language. Yeah, I'd be so sure of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can, I can be fairly it. sure it wouldn't <laughs> pull out. Uh, language, yeah, right. exactly. Well, I, uh, depending on what language we chose, which is, it may sound minor, but community-wise, that would be a discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that, so saying you aren't going to add staff isn't necessarily true, or it might be a shift in staff mm -hmm. or something. Be that would be a different. That would be a better way to put it. it yeah. A okay. shift in staffing. Yes. Well, I think it's very exciting, and I was curious if there's any thought on how Roxbury versus Union, I mean, how would that, that I know would it's all early, be part of the but process so as we were, we'd be discussing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think part of the goal of this is to answer a lot of mm -hmm. the questions that are being yeah. asked right now. Sure. What is the timeline that we're anticipating for this? A year-long study. Year-long, okay. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking, you know, fiscal year to fiscal year kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if if they find it feasible and if they have a good roadmap, what's the earliest that we could actually have an immersion program? Would it be two years from now? Could it be a year study and then put in a budget? I don't want to promise anything about that. <laughs> I'm not yeah. positive. But that's a question that we I don't think we can answer just yet. I think that the second, you know, two years out would probably be a worst case. The question is whether we might be able to do it in one year, but that's the one I'm not, I wouldn't want to Well, to. that would lead me to believe, are you going to ask for 22000 next year to continue the study for the next year? You know what I mean? It's uh, when I'm thinking of the money, 
I don't have any problem with the program or what's happening. I'm trying to think how does this money play out? Because <coughs> now I think I can explain to people this this amount of money is for a study to see see if I'm right. If we can do this, how we would do it and how much would it cost. But now you said maybe at the end of the year you won't know, so is that going to require more money than next year to continue studying? I can't answer that question without going through the year first. It's a, that's a trickier one for me to be explained. Could we hear from Jericho Elementary? Do we have con Mike about has a lot of experience with this program since he was the one who helped put it together over there. So, great, Mike. How was that year? Put you on the spot there, big guy. <laughs> Sorry, come up or? Yeah. <laughs> you weren't prepared for this at all. Hi. Only 1.7 behind you. What was the question? How Can long? you explain a little bit about Chitin and East history with the group around it, sure. language immersion? So, um, Chitin and East, um, we were the first uh, school district in the state to implement language immersion, and we tried to do it on our own. And we had to go back and retrofit quite a bit of work. And the first people we called were the Center for Applied Linguistics, which, by the way, are, are one of two organizations, both with the same parent organization, that do this work nationwide. There isn't many other folks. Some people have left and are doing private consulting, but they, they worked here. Um, so we called them, and they came up and helped us go through what they call the pillars of, language, of immersion programming. And so there's program structure, there's curriculum, instruction, assessment and accountability, staff quality and professional development, family and community and support and resources. And those are things that most organizations, when they try to do it on their own, don't think about. And so these folks come in and, and through a systematic way, really help us kind of parse out what, is, what are the details of our program so that day one it starts really strong and well and doesn't fizzle? To give you an example, when we started the program about three weeks in, we're like, what are we going to do for report cards? Like, how, do, how do we assess these kids? We hadn't really put that together. Those are the things that they help us really think about. Um, as well as just the extreme connections that they have to this world of language immersion and dual language and thinking about staffing, thinking about recruitment, thinking about costs. They do talk a bit about costs. Um, thinking about sustainable practice. They do have connections to a lot of uh, curriculum and you know, resources that you would need based on many different languages. Um, so they are the people to go to if you're starting a program. Maybe five years in, there might be different folks, but these are definitely strong folks to, to go to. Had you decided what language you were um, thinking of before you consulted? Yes. Yes. So we went through a, a, a very, um, I don't want to say intense, but it was an intentional process of discussing uh, which language, and everyone has a different opinion. We left it to data. We did a lot of research. Um, there was a big push in, in the Chittenden East area for French, and when we started to look for high-quality instructional materials, there were none. So that became a, a good um, kind of impartial factor in discussing the languages. So we determined that we were going to go with Spanish based on that. And people came to consensus on that. I think that would be a great process before or at the beginning of when you hired somebody to know, uh, oh, to know uh, which language you're talking about or which language the community was interested in. Why, why do you think that it, we have to nail that down at the outset? Why wouldn't you? Because we keep our options open. We have, I mean, we have, we have one of the leading um, schools of instruction of foreign language teachers on the other side of the mountain. Um, we might have teachers throughout the study. We might realize that we have some teachers who have some skill sets that we weren't fully aware of, or certifications that we weren't fully aware of. I don't know if we if we know all of that information or not. Um, and I wonder, you know, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, who knows what, whatever direction we decide to go in. 
I'd imagine Spanish there would probably be the most opportunity, but French and Chinese would also probably present a lot of opportunities. And I don't know if we'd want to box ourselves in from the get-go with one. Yeah, I'm I mean, I, suggesting I, boxing in, I'm suggesting that there be a discussion that the community could take part oh, in yeah, yeah. before you, oh, at the same time that you're doing, you know, it doesn't have to be done before you hire somebody, but that the community is part of the discussion. Definitely, should, they should. The community should definitely be part of the discussion. I agree with that. Yeah, and I agree with that too. But I, but I, I think that you know, part of, but you know, like the lineage, part of the process is figuring out all the factors that go into what makes sense. And, and also, just you know, I mean, my understanding educationally is that when you immerse particularly younger students in a second language, picking up the third, fourth, fifth, sixth languages. Becomes much easier once Great. those yeah. you know, once those those pathways are developed at an early age, the ability to pick up. You know, so the the fact that a second language is at an early age is more important than I think probably what that second language is. A, a follow up question. From education. A, a follow up question. Um, how is it structured in Richmond? Is it all in the target language, or is it? Uh, dual dual language. Yeah, so it's a it's a hundred percent K through two, and then it starts to reduce by ten percent each year after that, up till fifth grade. And that's intentional design based on visiting programs. Uh, we based it on a program in Menden, Upton, Massachusetts. They have a long established language immersion program. They became our partner school and our mentor. Um, we also partnered with Middlebury Language Schools um, and had. A broad network of connections so um, we're in good shape to work with them and partner with them they are having um, Cal come back to work with them and if the timing worked out we may be able to collaborate as well with them in terms of cost and all sorts of things and, and I'm assuming it's a choice yes it's a lottery system uh, students and families apply to be a part of it yep. how does that go Pretty well, actually. We spent a lot of time detailing it so that people felt comfortable that it was fair. Um, we reserved spots for free and reduced lunch students first, um, and it was per community uh, slot, so it went very well. It started the year after my kid was in kindergarten. Just, just <laughs> That's my only critique. And good with that. <laughs> Happy SDB. This is really helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this, this step. So. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Other questions? I have a question for you, Jim. Um, in terms of drilling into some of these items, which we've already started to do, I imagine we're going to continue to talk about these issues over the ensuing meetings. Is that right? Would you mind laying out the general process that you envision? Uh, yeah, so we're going to get uh, a second presentation 19th, on the 19th in Roxbury. Uh, it will be a, a similar deep dive. Um, so you know, Grant's going to have to bring his, his caffeinated coca cola out. <laughs> uh, um, and that will give Roxbury an opportunity to talk. And we'll also, you know, my guess is there might be some additional numbers or tweets then. Uh, you know, further, further opportunity for the board to, to delve in. Um, then we're going to have a, another private public presentation on January 2nd, uh, which will be I think, closer to final. And again, I'm, I'm not sure how much more information we'll have then in the state, but a little more. Yeah, we might have some more uh, equalized pupils. I don't know when we'll get the first one, but I'm sure we're going to get multiple versions of it as time yeah. goes on. Um, I'm going to have to go look at the calendar again, but I think we've got one more shot scheduled and I think time to have perhaps additional before I have the final go on. So typically between the first and second there aren't a whole lot of changes that I yeah. make other than new data that comes through. Mm -hmm. And then it's usually after the second one that I will start looking to see do you have things you want me to change before the third cut. And then between the third and the fourth, there might be some changes. But by the time it's the fourth cut, we're pretty much baked at, the, yeah. at that point. 
Yeah, and you know, this different professors. We're not doing our arbitrary pick a number and don't go over it. Yes. Yeah, that um, makes me crazy. So, yeah. Sure, I just have kind of a general observation. So, Grant, the capital plan looks great. And I know the village school doesn't need work. It's in largely great shape. But when I look at the capital plan table, we're all the way out to FY25, and the village school hasn't shown up anywhere. It wasn't in the bond, it's in here. Like, I know there's going to be some small things here or there. And I'm a little bit nervous that people might start asking, hey, what about us? And we're looking like six, seven, eight years out post-merger. Maybe some benches here or there. Maybe a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like, sooner or later, I think people are going to ask, hey, what about the village school too? Yeah, and I think the, the first pushback is the capital plan is supposed to be for big projects, sure. roof replacements, boiler replacements, you know, major bathroom replacements, or replenishments. Um, you'll see window replacements on here, but we're not talking about like five or six. We're talking about I would also say that um, so if Roxbury had a roof replacement that was in this timeline, it certainly would be on here. It, but I think we're good with some of those things. I think that uh, another argument would be um, we were thinking we might get down to a point where we're doing $50,000 for projects in the general fund, not the capital. But, 50,000 for kind of more routine projects at each of the three Montpelier schools and 25 maybe at Roxbury because it's smaller. Sure. Not, you know. um, but like this year, we we're probably closer to 75,000 maybe at each Montpelier school. Yeah. And I think in Roxbury it's like what, 62 and a half or something? So we're putting almost as much money in Roxbury and the general fund budget as we are the other schools. And we are doing a lot of work there. We did a lot of work in the kitchen. We're looking at bathrooms. We're looking at the town hall. So there is going to be some significant investment in projects. It's just they're not big enough on here yet because the big ticket items are, like you said, you're in good shape yeah, as a facility right. there. I guess I didn't have any concerns, but it was that it was FY25. And you yeah. know, people might start asking, and I just wanted to make sure that it was. It would be more convenient if somebody would rip some holes in the roof and we could put something on. <laughs> Andrew, could you speak to any? Could you speak to what you're thinking about for Roxbury for next year? I know the door at the town hall. And yeah, absolutely. We have some of the safety uh, safety grant money to to the new um, new door of the town hall. We have money allocated to spruce up the town hall. Um, there's also what we're looking at. Probably the biggest need that's at that building is the bathrooms. And that we've been budgeted, we've got money in the budget to revamp this, this coming year. Um, in the general. In the general. Yeah. Just so when Ryan or Lisa get, get those questions, they can say sure. details as to what what is in the general fund. Yeah, and a couple of additional comments on that. I'm, yeah, another school that's not on this is, is the high school. Uh, at least not listed. And yeah, there have been some community questions about the fact that the bond did not cover the middle school, and our answer has been you know, we have established this this capital fund um, that is going to address some of the issues at the middle school. And we like the middle school is eight of the twelve <coughs> scheduled items. So uh, you know, this is I think data to back up people who are that continue to ask about you know the middle school and the fact that the bond didn't cover the middle school. Um, you know, the data is here that the capital fund does have quite an eye on this. And, and, and yeah, we didn't ignore it. I mean, uh, Andrew's been looking at all the schools and the requirements. So I would say, you know, honestly, if there's a school that needs a roof, it doesn't matter which school, it would be on this list. Um, you know, the high school is a good example. We just did most of the roof here. We're going to do another set of roof as part of the bond project or as part of the fund balance. We've used a lot of, invested a lot of fund balance in schools too. Um, so this is, and there's time to tweak, as I mentioned. I mean, this was a kind of a, a quick, quick, um, you know, baptism by fire for Andrew to come in and then not only have to deal with all the stuff we're dealing with, but then also try to build a budget. Um, so I have no doubt that we'll be making some changes to it, but I think it's a first, a good first blush at, at a long-term look for now. And it won't be long before there will be something that pops up that's big enough to end up on this list for Roxbury. 
The bathrooms might have been, but we kept enough money in the budget to try to tackle that in the general fund instead of pushing it out. And since you've mentioned that the high school wasn't really on here, a lot of the money in the bond, however, is going to the high school. Mm -hmm. can, can you explain? The majority of it didn't take up the playground. The vast majority. Playground and playground. Can you explain how you calculate that there'll continue to be an increase in enrollment given the birth figures? I mean, how, how do you figure that out? Yeah, it's. Um, <clears throat> It's an actual big modeled spreadsheet that looks <coughs> at historical trends. And it looks at in-migration and out-migration from year to year. So it looks at over a 10-year period, we will have 108% of first graders as second graders. So we'll actually have an in-migration. It looks at birth, uh, not only birth data to calculate kindergarten, but then it looks at year by year what's the trend of in migration and out migration. Um, it, I'm a little nervous about the model right now because of the impact of adding Roxbury in, and that's not in historical data. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see how accurate the model continues to be over the next few years, and it may take a while to settle in with new good trend data over five ten years. But, um, but it is based on looking at historical, um, at historically how many first graders become second graders, how many second graders become third graders. So I mean, it's, it's good historical data that's modeled that more than one district uses. So I think it's as good as it gets. It's all, as you know, it's all a little bit of witchcraft. Well, but, and I'm thinking there's only so many houses and only so many people can live in my that's area. That's true, And you too. keep telling me it's going to increase, so you must be assuming I'll sell my house and somebody will move in my house with three kids. Yeah. We're going to change it into a duplex. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's where the model could be flawed, because I don't know that the model considers saturation of right. That's what I'm wondering. Because we've been lucky. Yeah. We've been increasing. And I mean, what will happen is the model will correct itself over time because as real estate and housing is, is saturated, you're not going to be seeing those increases anymore. So the model will correct itself, but it could be wrong in the near term as that dynamic is occurring. So yeah, I'm hopeful that we still see some level of increases, but I think it's going to slow. It might have a correction in the model, just like you know the stock market has a correction in it. We might see a correction in the model at some point, but right now it's still looking good. Michelle? Um, just, I don't think Montpelier is going to get full. It's not finite. So <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. But. Okay, let's check it. On the budget overview for FY19, you have 118000 for the proposed bond. For FY20, you said we're going to be paying more on the bond because we're paying capital and interest, not just interest. Mm -hmm. But that bond says... Zero. Zero. Did that go somewhere else? Yes. Okay. Because we had to show it as a separate article last year. Okay. So the 118 I had to show separately in case that didn't get approved so it would come out. Now it's just part of the, of the budget that along with all the other line expenses. Okay. And that's probably something I should have pointed out. The other thing that you might ask about is the grant funds budget. You'll see that in 18 there was a separate number for mm -hmm. grant funds because the way it used to be built is we didn't break out how we were going to spend title money or idea B money. We just said, you know, we will probably get $200,000 in title funds. So add 200000 to the expense at the end. Now we say we're going to spend title one money on this person, that person, this is the salary, this is the benefit. It's rolled into our actual budget now. So, you know, it'll be nice next year when we don't have to show that grant funds budget line because that history will be gone. But those, some of that uniqueness is going to happen for a few years. Um, but I should have probably called out that that proposed bond was there because it was proposed at that point. Once it's approved, it goes into general fund or the general budget. So the, the other question I have is you um, want us to make a decision about taking 87000 from the um, fund balance. And um, I don't think that you've told us what the fund balance is. Are, we, are you wanting to wait till we have the audits? Or? 
Um, yes, and and I'm probably going to get a draft of the. I was hoping that we might be able to have the audit available for the next meeting. That's where we slated it to go, but and it's not the auditor's fault. We we had we were delayed in getting some information because of a hiccup we had with fixed assets. So we're hoping to get a draft of the audit by the end of this week. Well, I don't know that we're going to have a final version in time for the 19th, but I do think that I will have numbers. So I think I will be able to say what the fund balance is. It's it's big because okay. we finished last year very good. Yeah. So I'm I don't want to say the word the number out loud, but you know I'm thinking it's like seven hundred thousand or something yeah. like that. So. It's eight, 87 five you could afford. Okay, I'm just checking. And we, we had talked before when we set up the capital plan and we talked last year, maybe the year before, when it, about this fund balance situation. Not all districts have a fund balance or they have policies regarding their fund balance and how it can be spent or what amount you maintain and so forth. I think we have a policy that says we have to maintain 2%. 2%. Um, and we haven't made any, we haven't had any further conversation about what we, we have free latitude with what we do with beyond 2%. I, I believe that is within the board's purview. I mean, what legally you have an article that says you have the authority to decide how to spend that. Okay. So I think now that you have that legal authority, it is within your realm to decide kind of the operation, operational rules behind how you want to manage it. Okay. But I've you, you don't have a recommendation for us as to how we... Um, I think that might be a subject for another, another day, day, but I do, I, 2%, I wouldn't go I just, higher than I just asked because we talked about it like last year, but that yeah. was a long time ago. I wouldn't go higher than 2%. Okay. I think that would certainly be the most I would say that you should require that, that is maintained. Okay. Um, and the reason why you want to have some is because you never know. You know, Mary does the best job she can at forecasting, like, but if outside placement needs for 19 in, months in advance, yeah. but you don't know if three kids are going to move in that need to be placed. So right. um, that could bite you at any point. Um, right. So it is good to have some money, but I think 2% is certainly enough. But so one good? one question on the on the audit, I think that the Montpelier board is supposed to meet to accept, to accept that it. audit. You are correct. Okay, just checking. And that is probably so maybe your last and final act. That is the last yes, and final yes, act. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and the rock and Roxbury as well. It will be. Okay. On the fund balance, can I just follow up briefly? Um, a couple of meetings ago, quarterly financial report, we were looking at anticipated unreserved fund balance of like $902,500. You just mentioned a $700,000 figure. Has that changed I a little bit? I don't have it. I wasn't... Okay. I, but this, this we can rely right, on. But I wasn't sure if that was after you had to... What's the bottom line whenever... There's some things you have to subtract out of there that we should make sure... That there's the unreserved, which is like $1.14 million, then possible Roxbury deficit yeah, settlement, so and then and then we okay. get to the I wasn't sure if the 900 was at the bottom or yeah. the 900 was before those came out of it. So, so that's yeah. what we're talking about? Yeah, and, the there's number. A, okay. and there's good reason to have a good chunk of that because we're yep. heading yeah. into a $4.9 million bond um, project mm -hmm. where... Costs right now are through the roof because of tariff issues and all kinds of things, and right. just saturation of, of vendors doing work and not not having people to do work. So we're seeing costs way up there. So it is nice to have a little bit yeah. of cushion that we might be able to put in there to make sure we deliver what we hoped to deliver. Um, so I would keep that set aside. We do have the last three deficit that we still have to cover. Um, so 87.5. I'm, I'm fine. I think you can definitely afford that. The problem is not this year. Yeah, yeah. The problem is next year. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm generally, I don't like to spend the fund balance in that for that reason. Mm -hmm. But that's I just wanted I, to some context on that. And that's what I was going to say. I think of spending the fund balance on one-time things, mm -hmm. not on your budget, because then next year. Yeah. And that's why it was associated with what we study. think might be another drop in one-time project. One so both can go away. 
but yeah, we're still in that think position we're where we, Pandora's we want to ne- in a way. We are. Really we don't good, want to but we don't wash. know what we don't so, know. Right. Maybe we do get rid of the fund balance revenue so that if we have a drop in one-time project costs, that helps stabilize the tax rate, um, especially since we're not going to be seeing a huge drop in tuition. In so, yeah. I didn't realize that until the numbers started shaking out and the tax rates started shaking out. Then I was thinking, wow, why'd I put that in there? Right. With the higher yield, it's a big difference. We're losing our superintendent here. She's looking pretty weird. Oh, we have, what, hour 16? We're good. (laughs) Keep going. Good. Thank you so much, Grant. Yeah, thank thank you, you very much. I will try to speed it up a little bit next time in Roxbury, but as, as Jim mentioned, it is kind of the opportunity for Roxbury folks to see it sure. for the first time. So you can't really show it. You should have your caffeine as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you to all the administrators that were here, too. Yeah, thank Even you. Even though we didn't ask yes. you 5 million questions, we were glad you were here. Did you hear him talking about NTSS? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that? Did you hear that talk about my business It's very impressive. So, uh, motion to adjourn. I move for you adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All in favor.